Lord, we 
Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this day. God, I just uh, humbly, Lord, ask that, that your anointing, God, would just come into this place. And God, transform our hearts and take us from where we are to where you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, Brent was uh, up, up in um, Canada this past week speaking. He had really powerful services up there. One he described is probably one of the most powerful he's ever had. You just don't know, guys, what's being released upon your life. I see it when I go out. I don't see it here as much, but then you go out, it's like, wow, something's yeah. happening inside of me. Yeah. And it's just a real strong anointing. God's depositing something upon us, and it's not just me or Brent. It's every person in here. And because you're like a sponge, and you absorb whatever environment that you're in. So anyway, uh, Brent went up to this conference up, up in Canada, very powerful and uh, just really eager to share. So we decided to spend Tuesday up at the Wednesday. Tuesday or Wednesday? Wednesday? Yesterday. Yesterday at, up at my cabin. So uh, Brent came up yesterday, and we just planned on hanging out with Jesus, eating some crabs, eat a steak, and um, just talk about what God's doing and, and things like that. Uh, he had mentioned about the warfare that, that, that he had been under coming back off this trip and about how his mom was sick. And so I guess it was just around lunchtime he started to get those phone calls from his brother who was at the hospital bed up in Kansas City. And I'm, I'm sharing this and I asked, his, I asked Brent's permission to share because it really, it, it was a day I will not forget. And to, to, to be there was something. So um, his mom, I, I don't know all the things that she was going through, but I believe her bowels were perforated. And then her organs started to shut down. They said that if they operated her blood pressure would bottom out, go to zero. So she would die in the operation. So they couldn't operate. And uh, she wasn't able to breathe a lot on her own, so they inserted, her a, inserted a tube to help her breathe. And she was going downhill. And when that last doctor's report, and we were at the cabin, and. Brent was getting several phone calls back and forth between his brother and the hospital room about his mom. And then when the report came in, when the doctor basically said, it's just about over. Uh, I, I, I could hear the uh, sense, the urgency in Brent's voice when he said, put the phone to mom's ear, I want to talk to her. And uh, I was privileged and honored to, to hear the last conversation between a son and his mom. And she had this woman, uh, you know, she carries Brent for nine months, gives birth. When Brent's at 12 years old, his father dies. So she's a single mom with three kids and broke three wild kids. And uh, I, I met his mom once, and she was a powerful, powerful intercessor, woman of God. Uh, she would move where God told her to move. She was sold out for Jesus. And... 
Part of the legacy that she left was her three children served the Lord. As a single mom going through all that, you know, the financial struggles and the adversity. Uh, so I was sitting there hearing this final conversation. What do you say? What words are adequate at this point? How can you express yourself in the next five to ten, to ten minutes to someone who was the most influential person in your life to... Um, To someone who was the most influential person in your life, not only as your mom, but spiritually the most influential person in your, in your life. And uh, to, as I said, it was an honor, it was a true honor to, uh, to be there, to hear that phone call. And... You know, I'm not going to share everything, but Brent told her how much that he loved her. How much she meant to him and how much she meant to, the, to his kids. How uh, she lived in Kansas City. She had a stroke a few years ago. Her health wasn't that great. But there was just something this woman carried. And uh, it just really made an impact on Ellie and Lance very powerfully. And uh, then he just started to describe what it was going to be like by reciting scriptures of people who had been, to, been up into heaven. Sorry, I'm trying to get through this. <laughs> and just trying to tell his mom what to expect in heaven. You know, what do you say? I mean, that last phone call of someone who's so important in, in your life. Um, you know, the time of, of regrets is over. The should have done this or should have done that. It's just, it's, it's all past. And you just... You know, you just got to pour, pour out your heart. And as I said, it was, it was an honor and a privilege to be, I've never heard this before. But in that situation, to really hear that final conversation between his son and his mom. And then uh, he had to leave and go back. And it just really, I could really sense the, sense the awaitingness of the situation. It was really impactful. And, and I remember during his phone call, he stepped out onto the porch, but I could still hear everything. And I said, God, you have me here for a purpose. What is this? Because this is a uh, special moment. It's a moment I'll never forget. It was that yesterday for, the, for my whole life. So after Brent left, I just started to pray. And the Lord said, uh, I made that phone call one day. I made a phone call like that. And he took me to John, the book of John. And just before the cross, he uh, sits with his disciples. And he's going to go to the cross soon. He, he, he knows this is his last chance to talk to him. And he tells them that he's not going to leave them by themselves, he's not going to be alone, but he's going to send his Holy Spirit. And he tried to describe throughout John 15 who that was. And then in John 17, he prayed over you. I just want to read that to you. This is after he prayed 
for the disciples. He says, and then next he prayed for you. He says, I do not ask for these only, referring to disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. He's talking about you and the person sitting behind you and the person sitting in front of you. That they may be even as we are, I and them, you and me, that they may become perfectly one. So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me, Father. There's something about these final words of Jesus to us when he said, the world will know that the Father sent Jesus when you and I and the person sitting in back and the person sitting in front when we become one. There's a dynamic that's released there is a, a power that is released that the world will know. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. This is such an intimate passage of, of kingdom of family and kingdom come unity and of you know just that phone call that Brent had with his mom was probably the most important conversation he had with her over his past 40 plus years this carries that same weight of us being in one us being one us being family unity and when that happens, the world will know that the Father sent Jesus. And when the Lord, the Lord just told me, yeah, I made that phone call too, and this was the phone call. So this thing, these, these important words of that last phone call, as the Lord really started to take me to, to, to these verses, and it's probably the most important thing that we could do. And if anything that we would model to this world, it would be in, here in John 17. That we would truly build here a kingdom family that resembles the book of Acts. That, that oil of one of unity is released. It's not a cultish thing. It's not a us against them thing. It's just an us with Jesus thing. And it's not buying some compound in the woods and all of us going down there and hiding and drinking Kool-Aid or nothing. <laughs> this is just about us with a common vision being as one in the kingdom. And it was that last call that was so important, that last message that was so profound. 
And as, as the Lord took me this, I said, God, I, we're going for this, but I still don't think we've got there. Uh, I, I, I just don't know yet what that looks like to be at that. We are one to be one with the people in the church as you are one with the Father. God, I, I don't know what that looks like yet, but God, I want to give it a go. I want to give it a try. Because you said, when this happens, the world will know that the Father sent you. Which means there's got to be a worldwide move of God. When you get that number, when you get a family of people coming together as one, you and me, as Jesus is one with the Father. It's one heart, one mind. It's like a group of people melted together. It's kind of like rain. Each individual raindrop comes down, but, but, but then it forms, forms the puddle, forms, it comes together, yet it's, it's made up of individual drops. Ephesians 4 says, speak the truth to one another. We are part of one another. We are part of each other. You know, I've, I've said this before about family. And as powerful as the bonds should be between a son and his mom, a, it is still a shadow of a kingdom reality because a kingdom heavenly reality is always higher than what is upon the earth. So if the bonds between a son and his mom is that strong, how much more should our bonds be? Because it's in the kingdom. It's in Christ. And when you're hidden in Christ, egos don't pop up and all, all that junk. It's when we're hidden in Christ together. And it's, it's not having one heart and one mind, meaning everyone thinks like the guy that's up here speaking. It's we have one heart, the heart of Jesus. We have one mind, the mind of Christ. Yeah. And I believe that's what that means. And as that bond between a son and his mom, that tenderness of that last phone call, how much more tender should we be with each other if we're in Christ? Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, it says, if the dead are raised... If limbs grow out, if blind eyes open, if deaf ears open, but if we don't get this love thing down between us, we don't get any points. We get diddly and not even any squat. It's, 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 it's a love thing. That above all, that releases the presence of Jesus across the city. It's this love thing that's stronger than the love between a son and his mom in that last phone call. I, I want to take you to that phone call and just let your emotions run just a bit on put yourself in that spot and just feel the emotion of that last phone call. God wants to do that greater with every person in here. That we're one in Christ. We're so united in what the Lord's doing. So powerful. 
I uh, had a chance one time, asked Reinhard Bonnke, he is a he has his team that he's had for such a long time. Some of the same guys that have been with him since the 80s are still with him doing these crusades and through all the pressure of these crusades. And uh, he was asked at his small time, small group gathering with him, and he was asked, how can you keep your team together? How can y'all stay together through this time, through 20 plus years? And he says, because we keep our eyes on the harvest field, the prize set before us. Amen. If we ever look, if we ever take our eyes off of the prize and we start to focus on each other, we probably tear each other apart. But we keep our eyes on the prize set before us. In other words, he was saying, we are all hidden in Christ. We are one with Jesus the prize set before us. Oof. This thing, this, this family, that the, the Lord, this kingdom, kingdom relationships that God's building it here, it has, has, to do with, has to do with a covenant, intimacy, and also a boundaries. Uh, you know, as, as we come together as one member hidden in Christ. The love that is released when that happens brings a fearlessness upon the church. A fearlessness and a great boldness. How do I know it brings a fearlessness? Because perfect love cast out fear. And on the other side, fear can cast out love if it's made to get stronger. Said that David loved Jonathan so much, their hearts were knitted together as one. I think that's a good symbol of what kingdom unity looks like. It's also like Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave herself up for her. We give ourselves up for each other. It's this love that we give ourselves up for. Something else that the Lord really spoke to me about, about this phone call, is to live a life, a life of purpose. And Brent's mom was an intercessor. And even through all the trials and tribulations she went through as a single mom, she had a purpose in her life. She lived a life of purpose. If you do not have, we are created for something greater than what, than what we are. We are created for the impossible when you put Jesus in the midst of that. If you start to lose sight of that, you will become frustrated. You will get bitter and you'll get depressed. And if that's happening, you're losing sight of the purpose that God created you to do. Thank you, God. A life without purpose is like a deadly disease. It'll kill you. You can always tell, especially guys, when they don't have a purpose, is they'll fill it up with hobbies and toys. There's always, because you have that, that void, that vacuum, that, that, that's got to be filled with the purposes of God. The test of to live a life of purpose is not in the good times, but when things get rough. When, when you have that life of purpose, living a life with a purpose, and it comes from being hidden in Christ, and it comes, which means 
that it doesn't matter if you have a lot or, or you have a little. You're so hidden in him, it doesn't matter. And you so trust him that it's okay. And so you have this, the test is not in the good times, but it's in the bad times. When things get rough, it's, you know, are you living that life of purpose? The purpose is, God, I want to run the race you've set before me. I want to, Lord, I want to change my generation. I want to do what you've called me to do. I want to disciple nations. In Philippians 3.9, Paul says that he wants nothing more. This is Paul's purpose. This is Paul's life of purpose. He wants nothing more than to know Christ and be found in him. See, so many times we identify our purpose with what we do. Right. Yeah. I'm an accountant, or I'm a mom, or I'm, I mean, there's a ton of things that you identify yourself with. But what Paul said, my purpose is, is that I'm found in him. That was so powerful. You were created to, to know God. Your purpose in life is to get closer and closer to Him. That's your purpose. You only do this through Jesus Christ. Your purpose in life is to bring God, it, it is to glorify God to the world. That's your purpose. Isaiah 43 says, Everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yes, I have made him. You were created to carry the presence, the glory of God, and to make him known to the world. You are created to appraise him. Your purpose is to praise God. It's to praise and to worship God. It magnifies him. Your purpose, you were created to grow in the fruit of the Spirit. Our purpose in life is to grow in character. We are, our purpose is to spread the gospel. Our purpose, we're created to use the talents God has given us, to not to hide them. You know, one of the most powerful questions you can be asked especially if you're in a period of um, frustration and you feel a bit lost, is Moses was tending sheep and uh, God came to him and asked Moses, what's in your hand? Like God speaks to Moses and he says, I want you to set my people free. And you go, yeah, right. How am I going to do that? And uh, God says, well... What's in your hand, Moses? Yeah. And it was that shepherd's staff that, that Moses had. And that, that's all it took. That's all it took to free Israel. We're always looking for what we don't have, and we think we need more than we have, and it's a lie of the enemy. And if he can keep you thinking that, you'll never be able to fulfill the purpose God has for you. The question is, what's in your hand? It, it, it doesn't have to be much. You know, it's like I heard someone say one time, if you're in a game of cards, it doesn't matter what hand you have. If God shows up, you're going to win. <laughs> what's in your hand? And uh, that, that question is just, kind of burned in me because we're always thinking we need more. We're always thinking we're inadequate. Always thinking we don't have enough. What's in your hand? Just take the small amount God's given you and let him bring the increase. The biggest thing we struggle with, with our purpose, especially with people who are prophetic, is we see our destiny down the road. 
and we get impatient to get there. And we don't understand the process of the heart. That how God has to do the gardening of your heart to get you from here to there. And some of us is going to be like wilderness, or Israel walked around the wilderness, which should have been a seven-day journey. Took 40 years until they figured it out. Uh, Yeah, we've been taking that journey, haven't we? (laughs) Just, God, I'm just satisfied, Lord, with what I have right now. We, we, We have this tension. Is we're, we're, we're thankful, but we always, we're hungry for more of him. Yes. But it's, it's that question. I, I just want you to ask yourself tonight, Lord, what's in my hand that I haven't used yet? Just really want, want you to ask the Lord that this evening. Jesus is building a church right now that is so powerful. It's life changing. What I see is a, a church that, that, that the presence of God is so real. The preacher doesn't even have to preach well, but people get radically changed because God is here. And His presence is just showing up and changing hearts. We had a, uh, yeah, I'll share this. We, we had a person, a couple, come to the school. And uh, first time, and they really struggled about it. And when they got home, had this huge fight over it. The next morning, he wakes up and he goes to his wife and he says, I I don't understand it, but that was the best three hours of my entire life and we got to go back. And it wasn't the message, it was just the presence of God. Just the presence of God. That final phone call really, to witness this, really moved me and really, just to be be there, it was an honor to to, to see this, the heart of a son say goodbye to his mom. What if we talk to each other like that all the time? If kingdom relationships are supposed to even be stronger than blood, what if the love and the tenderness was there like that all the time? Is this kind of heavy? I don't know if this is what was on my heart. Y'all are just staring at me, guys. <laughs> So I just want to release that spirit of just the of kingdom family, spirit of love, and just trust and family. That Lord uh, just felt something break yesterday when I was at the cabin. God, I just even believe it just broke over us as a church. That you're just going to take us together on a journey, together, to levels of intimacy with you together that are going to profoundly affect the way we view each other. Wow. Thank you, Father, for working in the garden of our heart. Lord, we just want more of you. 
Lord, I want to run this life with purpose. I don't want to be just waiting to the next paycheck or, but God, there's an over defining purpose, overriding defining purpose in my life, like a fire in my bones that I'm so, so sold out. Thought about that verse about how our life is just a, what a piece of grass that grows up in the morning and then the sun comes and it dies by the end of the day. And it's, it's true, it, it, it is. We're just a short time. And uh, God, I just want to run this race with everything I got. I just want to run this race with purpose, Lord. Father, I thank you. Um, I want to receive an offering this evening and this offering I, I haven't talked to them but I wanted to go to Natalie and to Brent for the expenses uh, they have to go out uh, for the funeral and Natalie has to take off work and I know it's a burden and as family we just want to come together and just to love on them right now. So we're just going to take this entire offering and we're going to give it to them. And uh, they do so much in this church, so much you don't see and you don't know. And they just have poured their life into this thing. And I just want you to pour your life into them right now. they have to leave here in the next few days, take their family up to Kansas City, then I guess to Minnesota for the funeral. And it's just, it's, it's just expensive. And uh, you know, I have to share this. Um, I was at the dentist's office one time and uh, it was so wild. The year before that, I was, had my annual checkup at the dentist, and he said, the filling in your tooth is cracked, and you need to get it fixed. And the filling's so big anyway, I can't refill it, so we got to do a crown. And I'd never had one of these. I said, what's a crown? And he described the technique of grinding your tooth down to a nub and putting a fake tooth on. I said, that is disgusting. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and, and, uh, and as I walked out of that dentist's office, the Lord spoke to me and he says, if you don't do this within a year, this will be worse. I went, eh. <laughs> About one year, seven days later, I bite down on something and my tooth shears in half. And so I go back into the dentist, and he said, well, it's worse. Now you've got to have a root canal. You just could have had a crown last year, and now it's a root canal. And I was absolutely petrified, terrified, the whole bit. I mean, I'm putting finger, I'm, I'm a wimp. Can I tell you? I pass out when they get shots. I, I really do. I've, I've passed out several times. Boom. They have to catch me. And I'm, like, I'm gripping. And the Lord had such mercy on me because when they started working on me, and this is true, I don't care if you believe it or not, but it happened to me. This breeze blew off over me. I was taken out of my body. And I was not dead. I was not on, I just had anesthesia in my mouth. I was not on sleeping stuff or anything. And I was hovering at the top of the ceiling looking down onto dentists and the dental assistant working on me. And I went into this encounter with the Lord. But my thought was, 
Why are they making so much fuss? I'm here. You know, I'm, I, I'm not there. I'm here. And I've always remembered that thought of, you know, and I've heard other people say that in near-death experiences. It was just like taking off an old pair of jeans and throwing them away. It didn't matter. I mean, that's that body, that earth suit's not me. I'm here. And uh, I shared that with Brent. and It was just so powerful because I know his mom experienced that yesterday. We were praying, Brent and I, for his mom. And just before that phone call, the Lord spoke to Brent and he said, because we were praying for her to be healed, and the Lord said, um, let her go, let her go. And that's when he said, put the phone to her ear, I need to talk to her. And that's when that final phone call started. What the Lord wants to do here, and I, 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 I have a hard time with my mind wrapping around this, but there's a family God wants to birth that the bonds are stronger than that last phone call. So Father, I just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to sow into the Engelmans. Lord, that we're going to cover their expenses to go to this funeral and to minister to his family, to minister life to his family. Lord, we love them. We thank you that they're here. We thank you we can run the race with them. Amen. Why don't you all just come up and give them a hug. And here's the bucket.